Welcome everybody to our second episode of the Vardian Architecture panel. Um, this time I'm having with me Peter Leto and Peter Holmström from the Vardian offices in Turku, Finland. And I'm Bernd Hopp speaking from the Berlin offices here in Germany. And today we're going to talk... <coughs> Sorry, my voice is a little attacked as you can hear. Today we're going to talk about dependency injection architectures. <coughs> so um, to introduce my credentials first, I was the original author of the Vaden to Juice add-on um, for the integration with Google Juice and I did some uh, some kickoffs for companies that wanted to use this add-on in la middle to large size applications. Um, with us also here is Peter Holmström, who was the original author of the Spring to Vaden add-on. And we have Peter Leto here, who has a lot of experience and gave a lot of talks just recently about dependency architecture and Vaden architectures. So I, I took a little freedom to introduce you guys, but um, Peter, would you like to give us a little more info about yourself? About me? All right. Yes. So, uh, current work title is Vardin Architect and has been so for many years now. Um, I've been mostly working with sort of back-end stuff. So everything up to the Vardin UI and, and, and what's happening below it, integrations to other systems. So dependency injection is a very well-known subject in those areas. And uh, I also have some, I've formulated some pretty clear opinions about how I like to use dependency injection in, in our systems. So but it's, I think it's going to be a good discussion. So you have some clear rules of some? Not necessarily rules, but I, I let's just say I have my, and my own way of approaching dependency injection. <laughs> All right, let's go deeper in that later. Yep. Um, Peter, what about you? Yeah, so my official title, if titles no matter, is a principal Vaadin expert. And as my day-to-day -day job, I mainly work with customer projects, helping customers succeed with Vaadin applications and the application development. And my role is usually a lead developer from a technical point of view in, in application projects. And quite often we found ourselves using, uh, for example, Spring or Java EE dependency injection mechanisms for implementing various types of different application architectures for the Vaadin apps. And I try to bring into this discussion my experiences from past customer projects and, of course, my way and vision of how to use DEI. So let's hope that it somehow matches with Peter's ideas. Uh, we will see. I'm looking forward to that discussion because we we found out that we do have different, very different approaches uh, to dependency architecture, and I think that's that will be an interesting discussion because you you can approach it in different ways. Yep. Um, <clears throat> before we before we go deeper into the subject, uh, I would like to get our viewers on the same page and give a very short introduction uh, to how dependency injection works inside of Vaadin. And so I will show my screen now. Uh, let's open tutorial. This is the uh, standard spring to Vaadin tutorial application that you can find on GitHub. Uh, the link will be in the video description. And now you guys can't see my screen, but I will keep it short. Um, what we see now is a UI class called MyUI. It has a Spring UI annotation. That means it will be a spring bean, basically. Our UI will be a spring bean. And 
that is in this file all you can see from Spring, uh, from um, Varden to Spring. Um, it is a just a regular UI file <coughs> um, with some CSS layouts, a navigation bar, and some buttons. And if we open the views, you can see that every view here has a Spring view annotation. <coughs> that means uh, Spring will also work together with the navigator to set up the views as Spring beans, and it will have scope annotations. These scope annotations are um, are the most crucial part to understand if you want to use dependency injection, whether it will be Spring or Juice or uh, Java CDI. Um, it is important to know what these um, scope annotation do. Um, if you use Spring before, you may know that there is a, a prototype and a singleton scope. That means in a prototype scope, every for every injection, for every auto wire, you get a new object, and with singleton, you always get the same app object. Now we in in Baden uh, application, we we have two additional scopes, which is the UI scope, meaning that you always get the same object as long as it is inside of the same UI. So in every UI, for example, you have, uh, let's say you have a button that you want to have on different places inside your UI. You give it a UI scope and it will be the same button uh, in, all, in all places where you inject it. Um, if you give it a view, if you put it in a view scope, um, the scope will be a little smaller. It will be the same object as long as it is, as it is injected inside of the scope of your of a view of a certain view. And then there is also a third scope, the session scope, Vardin session scope. Um, right, that is um, the Vardin session scope. That is when you want to have, uh, for example, a user object that can be or that should be shared between several UIs, but in the same Varden session. You might use a Varden session scope. It's a little rarer. I'm, I would say UI scope is by far the most common scope to use within Varden project. But these are the three things. Um, that you the three scopes that you need to understand in order to use <coughs> dependency injection properly. Um, this is this is what what you can see now is a Spring application. I'm gonna check out the Juice branch so you can see that there is very little difference. Now, Spring UI changed to Juice UI. No, it did not, but it should have. No, there is something, something went wrong, but let's just say that in Juice, you basically change uh, the word Spring to the word Juice everywhere. You have a Juice UI instead of a Spring UI. You have a Juice View scope, uh, a Juice View instead of a Spring View, and um, there is little more to know about that, except that the configuration of Juice works a little different. Um, you need to use modules instead of application XML files. Um, and there are, there are small differences, but in, in general, I think for our discussion, we can just focus on Spring, um, because the differences, I think also between Spring and CDI are not too much in the Vardin integration, but in, in these, inside of these frameworks themselves. Now, I would like to go over and give over uh, to Peter, who has his own project, so we can take a deeper look on how we would set up a 
component or how we would inject components, bottom components that is, with a <clears throat> spring-based solution. All right. So as we initially discussed from the development point of view, um, the primary purpose of using these different annotations on the UI and view classes are simply to make these as the dependent injection mechanism managed beans. And what this in practice means is that instead of, for example, using the new keyword, um, we are just saying that we want a bean of this type and then the dependency injection container is responsible of the life cycle of that particular bean. And quite often when, for example, auto-wiring or injecting uh, additional beans and dependencies into our UIs, we always need to take care that something called injection chain is preserved. And this means that if there is even a one new keyword being used in between of different injections, then we are breaking that injection chain. And hence, we will always have to auto-wire things into one another. And of course, this is nothing new to developers uh, familiar with Spring, for example, in the past. But let's just say that uh, the direction from where Vardin is coming from, Vardin by itself isn't dependent on any of the index injection mechanism frameworks. And that's why uh, all these features have been provided as add-ons for the actual framework. And that's why also the uh, concept of injection chain and the scopes might not be uh, familiar with all the developers using Vardin. And the reason why I'm actually talking about this is that as I said, uh, the Vardin itself doesn't really uh, declare the components as managed beans. So that's why, for example, the case where we uh, would want to auto-wire some Vardin component, that wouldn't be possible uh, by default, as the DI container wouldn't be aware of such beans. And I've written a little example application uh, for an add-on that I wrote called Bean Grid, and the Bean Grid can be downloaded from the Vardin directory under the name uh, Bean Grid Add-on for Vardin 8. And its purpose is to basically allow us to write uh, code like this, with simply auto wires, for example, a grid of a certain type. And since Vardin 8 now provides the ability to um, enhance the type information of different components with a specific types, for example, the customer right here, uh, we can use this information, the generic typing, as parameters when injecting the grid of a customer type. And how this looks and how it works is that we basically have a UI that displays a simple grid, but if we're looking, for example, the code, we have not really declared any of the columns or any of the column headings or, for example, any of the summary rows at the bottom within our actual UI. But instead, what we've done is simply provided some test data as the content of this grid. And basically, then the question is how Vardin is now able to uh, auto-wire the grid. And this, of course, now takes place through something called bean grid configuration which in terms of spring is a configuration bean, which means that the presence of this bean in the class path is enough to make spring aware of grid type of an injection point or bean. And if we, for example, breakpoint the line 62 right here and just refresh our UI, what will happen is that we are invoking through spring the configure bean grid method, which is now a mechanism for providing our Vardin components as spring managed beans. And of course, different DI frameworks work very differently and they have different types of features. But one of the nice features from spring is, for example, that we can pass in something called dependency descriptor. It's just a simple uh, object from the uh, spring, spring factory. And basically, through this dependency descriptor, we are able to get all the necessary information from the injection point where we are currently injecting our grid. And if we just a little bit debug further, we can use something called resolvable type from Spring, which basically gives us the actual type of our grid with the generic type of customer inside of that. 
and moving forward we can get the actual generic type and finally the actual item class which is now the customer as declared on the injection point and as we're now able to access this information on the configuration time of the bean we can quickly peek in to the uh, actual uh, customer class and just see that we have some properties which have been annotated with grid column annotation and these are now the placeholders that declare which columns the grid should be rendering from this type of bean and of course the add-on then supports additional uh, definitions as well for example editable columns or summarizable columns I'm not gonna visit this through now so if you're interested you can take a look at this add-on from the directory but point being that this is an example how we can utilize dependency injection mechanism and just move the code that has to do with the configuration of the bean outside from the actual client and let other parts of the code take care of the instantiation and scoping of the bean as well as all of its configuration and from the client point of view our test UI we are only saying that we want to auto wire a grid of a certain type and let DI take care of uh, all the other parts of the of the mechanism and I think this is quite commonly used pattern in, in different customer projects and I would also say that one of the good points with this is that in this case we have not for example extended the grid and we have not declared the uh, bean definitions on the on the actual grid class that would be extended from the grid but rather we're just using the very basic grid of type customer so if we're just looking at the imports we are not really using any custom components or anything that would have been extended from the grid in order to position these uh, annotations for declaring them as being on the grid but rather this is just a direct VADIN import which then again makes our dependency tree quite much lighter and I would say that application even even more maintainable so at least this is from my point of view and experience uh, one of the very very good patterns how to uh, for example utilize DI with writing components uh, Peter Peter would you disagree no not really at least not on this level of, of, of detail it's uh, this is pretty much the way I would approach it as well um, the problem that I normally run into with dependence injection in widen application is that you try to do use it for absolutely everything mm -hmm. and that I really don't like when you start to actually inject labels you start to inject layouts uh, it becomes really tricky to figure out what exactly gets injected where especially if you're dealing with with different kinds of, of, of scopes let's say you have different reusable components and you want to inject different dependencies of the same type into different instances of these reusable components and if you if you're doing this without ever breaking uh, the dependency chain or injection chain then it will become a mess really really quickly and uh, that's why I normally start out uh, without dependency injection. I actually design all my components as a constructor injection. So that uh, if you need any dependencies, you always inject them through the constructor. And uh, I try to avoid using field injections at all times. Because this means that you can use this component independently without a dependence injection container and just manually inject the stuff. Or you can turn it into a bean either by annotating the class or creating a separate bean configuration that makes it available for injection. And in this, in this way you can sort of choose at a later stage whether this will actually be a sort of self-contained bean that you create using the new keyword or whether it will be a spring or CDI managed bean that you can inject. Um, and that's uh, also how I approach uh, development in the back end where, where dependence injection normally is slightly less complicated because it's more common to work with singleton beans there. And whereas in, in Avad, in, in most cases you definitely do not want the singleton bean because then you'll end up with shared 
shared components throughout the entire system, which really might have strange side effects. So th that's the way I, I look at this. So I think it's a good tool, but I don't think it's a sort of silver bullet that's useful for all, for all situations. And I, yeah, and I also think that it's a really good that you are aware of the different ways of using uh, dependency injection. It's not only using the, the component annotation or named annotation, application scope, session scope, and then auto wire. There are different ways of using it. And you should be aware of all of them because they are useful in different use cases. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, I think I would say that uh, quite often in, in, let's say, real, real customer projects, uh, when DI is to be used, we quite often first try to declare uh, some kind of very high-level abstractions. And this is simply because DI, of course, uh, is, emp is empowered by the uh, dependence inversion mechanism. And dependence inversion, regardless if you use DI or not, is a very powerful yeah. abstraction in, in any object-oriented uh, software development and that's why for example first identifying the high-level abstractions then splitting them down into a bit smaller pieces and just trying to keep the abstraction level as high as possible is most likely the best way to write like very quality application code and then apply DI on that. Yes. And that's exactly what this constructor injection does it inverses the, the, the control of injection so you're actually giving the objects needed to the constructor and as a side effect uh, you you sort of try to keep your objects small enough because nobody wants a large constructor which takes lots of arguments and when you end up with an object that requires a lot of constructor arguments then chances are it's doing too much yes. and then you need to split it up into smaller parts and that's sort of also a an early warning that your design might be going in the wrong direction. And that's also a reason why I like to use, use constructors. Mm. Another reason why I like constructors is that you can't accidentally forget to inject stuff. Because if you're having like private or package protected field injections and then you extend the class, yep. then you have no idea whether you've actually remembered to, to, to inject values into those fields or not. Whereas if it's in the constructor, you will need to also extend the constructor and then you get this for free. Yeah. And let's say that even from the code testability point of view, I would say that avoiding field level injections is always a good policy. Yes. So at minimum always, I would advise to use these header based injections at least, if yeah. not constructor for some reason. Um, or actually when talking about tests, uh, if you want to use field injections, then use package level visibility for those fields. And then if you have your test class in the same package, then you can just set the values. Uh, never ever try to use introspection to sort of look up private fields and, and inject stuff that way. I've seen it, it's not a beautiful site. And that is not restricted to dependency injection. That is a, a general, whether you, you use dependency injection or not, uh, that is a general uh, good practice, I would say. Are you guys using um, dependency injection with uh, MVP patterns? Sometimes, yes. Yeah, I try to avoid MVP nowadays. And we're not going to talk about why this, <laughs> this time. It's, yeah. uh, <clears throat> it's out, the, out of the scope. Of this of discussion. discussion. Yeah. Well, it is, but I was wondering because you said you prefer um, constructor injection. But I would think uh, if you have a, a, a presenter and a controller, uh, at some point you need uh, uh, field injections. Don't you? Do you not? Not necessarily. But uh, I would actually, I would actually say that the MVP in general, uh, how Peter said that he is not really very big fan of that. Uh, I know that during the past years we've been delivering quite some wide trainings where we have uh, mentioned MVP and, for example, we have recommended this as that as a uh, best practice for the architecture of different UIs and views and, and whatnot. But that usually ends up with the problem that there is one view class which is 
enormous and it has an enormous presenter as well and that sort of defeats the purpose. Yes. So I think yeah. that going with the like high level abstractions and then let's say that instead of having a view that has all the modding components laid out separately, try to form those abstractions in terms of, let's say, customer editor or customer listing and have these yeah. discuss with each other. Yes, I, I'm, I'm more for a component-based approach nowadays, so there's no separate presenter view. It's more like a self-contained intelligence components that discuss with each other, or then there might be a shared model that the, the, the components interact with and subscribe to. And in this case, there's no circular dependencies anywhere, which means you can use constructor-based injection. And of course, if you still want to, you can internally inside of these like self-contained components use MVP, if that for any reason adds any value to yeah, you. Yeah, but then that doesn't necessarily even need to be spring managed in this yeah. case, since it's a, a, an internal part. How about event bus? You said you, they can subscribe to a certain model that sounded like an event bus. Yeah, in a way, yes, but it's a very, very scoped event bus. It's more like the observer pattern than the event mm -hmm. bus. And uh, the reason for this is uh, I managed to shoot myself in the foot really, really badly with an event bus. In fact, I blew both my legs off. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah. Uh, the re the problem with this is that uh, when you're doing event bus driven development, you really, really need to be aware of of the fact that you're writing a multi user application, and uh, what is the scope of the events that you're firing, because if the events go outside of your UI or even outside of your session, then you need to be really, really careful. And this was what happened in, in one project where we started leaking events. And even in cases where we intentionally fired global events, uh, the event handlers were actually responding with, within the same transaction, within the same security context. And some of those events also read, uh, led to UI updates in, in the other UIs that were active. And these updates were then run as the user who fired the event, which leaked security context details into all the other sessions that were active on that server. And uh, for this reason, I now try to be very, very careful with event buses. So if you're actually doing global event buses, it needs to be run in a separate thread so that it's isolated from the current security context, it's isolated from the current transaction context. And this is why I actually don't use event buses that much anymore. I try to do it more like observable models where you subscribe to this particular model instance. And then if you need to fire global events, you do that on a separate channel. And then you make sure that you absolutely know that these are globals and they are run in a separate thread or, or in some other way. Another thing with the event buses is that at least something that I've experienced is that you can't really rely on the order of execution of no. these events. So if you have to have some kind of mechanism of making sure that things happen in an expected order, then event bus certainly is not no. the mechanism for uh, you. Actually, uh, what I've d discovered or, or read lately is that some events, it's better to sort of defer them. So you re-register the events but then you will fire them in the end of the transaction after the transaction has already been committed or just before it has been committed. Uh, because those events shouldn't really lead to any side effects within the current transaction. It's just a notification that something has happened. Yeah. And uh, by deferring the events, you're sort of building in this, this uncertainty of order into your system so that you can't actually rel rely on it. And that also makes it possible to make your events asynchronous if needed, because then you start to treat the event just as a notification that something happened and not as a sort of listener and a call for action, yeah. which is what had happened in this particular project that I was talking about. They were actually using events to sort of drive the entire application model so that instead of firing, invoking a specific method, they fired a specific event that was observed by exactly one uh, 
listener who then did something and uh, instead of just making this direct call between these two objects they had this this unnecessary decoupling which also meant that there was sort of no idea of there was no easy way of debugging this figuring out which object controls which and so on so you can do you can do too much decoupling too much sort of event bus driven dependence injection des driven design as well which uh, is not good well sure but let's stay let's uh, let's stay on the topic of uh, intercomponent communication uh, let's say let me give you a scenario let's say you have an application that has a login functionality and once the user is logged in um, you want to navigate to his I don't know to his messages view or whatever you want to navigate somewhere you want certain um, certain components to be visible or invisible and you want to have his name displayed in the upper right corner so uh, how would you do that I would I would use an event bus but I'm not quite sure maybe you have an, a better idea uh, I don't think I would be using an event bus for this. No, me neither. I, I actually, would do it no. as a simple callback. Yeah, and actually, All I right. think I think more to the point is that we clearly want to first identify that okay, now the user has signed in, and after this, we can utilize the scoping features of DEI mechanisms. So we can, for example, have a bean in a session scope that now declares that this session has been signed in. And this would also give us the additional benefit that if the user should open a new browser tab, yep. he would already be signed in yes. in that tab. So I would say that DEI, as, as Peter seems to agree, would be, uh, from the event bus point of view, um, like bit off the top yes. and, and something like too much yeah. but um, because what we are really doing there is, is quite simple we're signing in and when that logging in happens uh, at that stage quite often we for example switch the login view or login screen to the actual Vardin app or just switch views and then at that very same time we can for example update the header parts of the application or whatever and all these are still operations that are in a way quite synchronous so yes. they all take place but they take place in a certain order and the event bus in this case would probably just make things more yeah, complex it would i completely agree it's uh, it's overkill to use an event bus in this case oh well but I'll, i i must uh, i must admit i like uh, i liked the code i did that once and it looked elegant to me to have it in this way because you can, for example, um, you can do that in the in the very start. For example, you you open up a new UI, you go to the init method, you look into the session in your Vardin session if there is already a user available logged in, and then you can fire the same event from there that you would maybe fire from your login button or wherever from your logic, and I think with with regular callbacks it would be a little harder to do or or at least it it wouldn't be that straightforward in my in my case case not necessarily that depends on how you do it and if you're using java 8 method pointers you can do that really nicely i mean you well, could have a private well, method that's show login screen and another private method show main screen and then inside your your init method you check if you're logged in then you will call the show main screen otherwise you will call the show login screen and then the login screen if it's a separate class then it can take a method pointer as a parameter to the show main screen method and then when you click login inside that view it will just invoke the same method so it doesn't necessarily i mean that's exactly the same functionality without using an event bus and i don't think that's necessarily sort of more difficult to understand um, well, we can agree to disagree here. Um, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> uh, just one question. Yeah. Uh, what was the yeah. scope of the event bus in this case? Was it sort of UI scoped or session scoped or was it a global event bus? Vardin session scope. Uh, actually, the scenario that you Bern, described, um, I have one example from also from a past project um, regarding something something like this where the login was implemented with the event bus mechanism and at least there the problem was that when we were sort of laying out 
the basic foundation of the UI components, for example, the application header, we were auto-wiring the application header component into the actual UI. And at the time when the header was auto-wired, the header also contained the information about current design and user. And at that very stage when it was auto-wired, the user was not necessarily signed in already. No. And then we get the little problem that, okay, now that we have the header here, uh, but we are not yet signed in, should we even display the header or any of the information about the currently signed in user? And at that stage, is it then better if we fire an event from the event bus that then updates this currently signed in user information as probably Bernd would, would like to do it. But then again, uh, then we have to introduce the logic of not displaying all the information until the user has signed in and then move yeah, that I know. part what of the call. What we did was uh, on startup, we, if, if there is a user present, uh, when, when the UI init method is run, we fire a uh, login event, otherwise we fire a logout event that will set up everything like the user was freshly logged out. And that, I mean, it worked for us. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, there are so probably a lot of lot of like very good scenarios with event bus, and I don't think we should really get uh, too stuck with the no, with the downsides of no, that. No, no, but no, no. it's a very capable mechanism, and I think event bus in general like very nicely utilizes the good things of DI, and it allows you to make really loosely coupled uh, bits of the application architecture yeah. that and, really and, helps up with and, the and especially in, in the back end. It's really useful, and if you're doing advanced domain design, domain models, getting the domain events through the event bus, which allows other other parts of the system to react, not necessarily within the same transaction. So it's really a useful tool, but like all tools, it needs to be used in, in the correct way. And now, by the way, we, we've got less than 10 minutes left of, yeah. of our reserve time. All right, um, shall we go on? Uh, real life experiences. Uh, would you guys, think would you actually, guys yeah, tell, tell us some, tell us some of the yeah. some of in, most interesting cases that you had with CI? Uh, uh, I already told you how I blew my legs off, <laughs> and that's probably the the most important real life experience that I want to share because it's uh, it was quite of a mess to clean up afterwards. We did manage to clean it up, but it it took a lot of effort. Yeah. Okay, let's let's say that if that was the sort of the low point of, of, yeah. of your career, like blowing off your legs, uh, I think like DI can then also provide like some very very nice capabilities. And one of such things that I personally like very much is is the concept of that I like to call like uh, deployment time configurability based on what beans you have available. And I think, for example, in Vardin, this is something that developers can really nicely utilize. And what I mean by this is that, for example. All the views that we have in Vardin, which are annotated with the Spring view in this case, are just simply Spring managed view beans. And we have means of detecting what kind of beans we have available in our application context. And for example, the menu that is shown in the Vardin app that allows us to navigate between different views, we can fully dynamically build this menu based on what kind of beans we have. And this I would even call a um, uh, like a poor man's OSGI because we don't really yeah, need any of you the OSGI functions there. Build a modular system yeah. if you have different jars in your class path that exactly. contain different views. So yeah. So based on, for example, real life experiences, uh, I think something that is quite popular nowadays is all types of dashboards that visualize whatever kind of corporate data. And let's say that these dashboards are sometimes such that they end up on, on different companies from a software company. And many of these dashboards have some kind of basic gadgets that they display, yeah. but then some special customers might have requested some special types of gadgets. Yeah. And we have absolutely no necessary or necessity to change any of the like infrastructure code to support new types of gadgets. We just declare them as beans and have them available in their own separate jars with the deployment. Yeah. And just the presence of this jar is able to associate it's that gadget. Oh, so, so you... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, he, here I'd like I, to fill in that I, it's. Um, Speaking about making pluggable systems and dependency injection, I once uh, did a project where uh, the requirement from the customer was uh, explicitly not to use dependency injection frameworks because they make your system more complex. 
Um, so I ended up building a system using constructor-based injections and the standard Java service locator. And it worked out pretty nicely. I could still sort of utilize the dependence injection concept yeah. and make it modular without actually relying on Spring or CDI. So that's a, a, a good thing to keep in mind as well, that you can actually utilize these concepts yeah. without a container. Yeah, and exactly the point being there is that utilizing the concepts of dependency injection in my book means that you are basically using dependency inversion. Yes. And then if you really want to, you can then enhance that by actually plugging in a dependency injection system. Yeah. But just from the architectural point of view, uh, dependency inversion principle is the one that allows you to make these like pluggable uh, yeah. modular systems. And this uh, Java service locator system, it's uh, for in some cases, it, I'd say it's even sufficient. You know, if, if your main goal is to create a, a modular system and you don't want to use a full-blown dependency injection framework, then Java has built-in mechanisms for this yeah, exactly. that work perfectly fine. And now we but, have five but minutes left. they don't left. have scopes. They don't have scopes, but that means you, you need to control your own scopes, but that's not necessarily a bad thing either. It very much depends okay. on your use case. Uh, sometimes it might even be preferable to, to have control over your scopes yourself. Uh, because it's sort of uh, less magic behind the scenes going on. So it's, uh, it's another tool in the toolbox, let's put it like that. Right. So I hear that you, Peter, you're not fond of too much magic in your code. Uh, I, I, it, it depends. If I feel that I have uh, control over the situation and I know exactly what's happening, uh, then I'm fine with it. But uh, sometimes I've been in so many projects where there's been so much magic that nobody really knows anything about except maybe one guy. And normally yeah. that guy has been myself. And then the other developers have misunderstood this or they didn't, uh, I, 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 I forgot to tell them about it. And then it's caused a lot of problems. So. Uh, there is a, um, uh, there is sort of a balance that you need to strike between too much and too little magic, especially if you're not alone in the project. If, if you're alone, then you have the code in your head, then you know exactly how everything works, or at least you think you know, you understand exactly how it works. But if, if you have a team, uh, you really need to sort of consider the knowledge level of the team as well. Are they fa how familiar are they with this dependency injection? They need to know that there's more to it than just inject yeah. or auto wire. Yeah. Let me tell you real quick how I try to find the right balance in these cases. Um, when I st like started programming uh, years ago, it was. Uh, I, I realized that you can have messy code as long as the mess is contained inside a method or a class, but not leaked to the outside. If you have a good API, it's not that much of a deal if your implement if your actual implementation is a little messy. And that is that that uh, when when I uh, when I learned uh, dependency injection, I tried to 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 really have no new keyboard at all, just to see if it is possible. And it is possible. What you do is you like you have you subclass the Varden label class for every every label. And you you know you have a subclass for every component that you want to use. And then that's perfectly possible to avoid a new keyword at all. Um, and but that is it is doable. It doesn't help the code along very much because you have lots of boilerplate code and um, but it is it is doable um, eventually I was then too lazy and I, I started like all right I just need one label here let's just create a new label so as long as I as I can say here inside of my method inside of my constructor I keep all the mess here I just need one label uh, in one place, so I create a new one. I don't need to have it injected. And that is basically my my rule of thumb on how to decide it. Can I keep? Can I not not expose outside of any method that I'm using the new keyword? You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, I think like in a way I would be somewhat on the same page with you that I would always start and I think like the best practice that I've seen so far is that first try to come up with the sensible API, the sensible abstractions and then inside of these abstractions, inside of these modules, you are more free to do whatever kind of magic or, or code that ever you like. But from the outside, from the client point of view, the code that is using your modules through these abstractions, that needs to stay very, very clean. And the API there needs to be very good. But then inside of these modules, there you are more free to do the actual dirty work if you, yeah. if you ever have to. Uh, we're going to need to summarize now. All right, summaries. Um, well, my summary, um, let's just to give a, a real quick um, good practice for me is, as I said, um, dependency injection, whether, whether which framework you use, I think it can help along your code very much. It can, it can help you a lot. Um, you just need to figure out for yourself how much, how much DI feels good for you, how, how deep you want to integrate it. And you need to avoid some some pitfalls, as Peter described, that you can have. There is there is some pitfalls that you just need to know about, especially when it comes to using event buses, for example. But yeah, it, uh, not only uh, event buses; it's uh, multi-user systems in general, because you can shoot yourself in the foot and blow your legs off using the wrong scope as well, uh, which has happened. So uh, multi-user systems, remember that. Always be aware that there are many sessions, many users using your system at the same time. I would argue that you can make the same mistakes without, uh, without dependency injection. Yes, you can, but it's easier to do it with dependency injection, especially in Spring, where the default scope is singleton. But you can use Juice, where the default scope is prototype. Um, so my summary is: um, go ahead, try that. Try try out for yourself um, what what you feel is is the right way. To use dependency injection because if we if the three of us can't agree on what exactly is the right way to do um, I think we gave you some cues and some hints on what scenarios are possible and you can just go ahead now and see what what feels and looks best for you what you think helps your code along the most yeah and I'm actually happy that we're not entirely agreeing on everything because that means that we probably know what we're talking about. Most likely. Yes, true that. So everything is good as long as you start with the abstractions and then use dependency inversion and only then spice up with the actual injection. Injection. Yeah. So does anybody have anything to add now? Some less I thought this some less was a, I thought this was a really fun discussion. And I think we could have gone on for, for yeah. quite a while, especially by increasing the scope slightly, so scope creep. But uh, well, maybe we'll have another discussion later about something else. We can think about having, a, having a, another architecture panel and go deeper in, in certain, certain areas if you want. All right, I think it was a fun discussion. Peter, do you have anything? Peter, do you have anything to add? Mm, I think everything that was worth mentioning has been said and we can agree. Yeah. <laughs> Good. No hard feelings. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, it was fun talking to you guys. I hope our listeners enjoyed it a little as well. And um, thank you for the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.